Bonjour. This is New Testament video 262, John lesson 16. A new chapter. 5. John 5. Heavenly Father, may we rightly divide the word of truth and receive the information that you desire to communicate through these words. In Christ's name, thank you. Amen. John 5 John 5 1 After this there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. Four. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Okay. Some controversial material. John 5, 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Jesus goes into the mountainous area of Jerusalem. He goes up. He ascends the mountains. A higher elevation. There's a feast of the Jews. The Holy Spirit through John does not specify what feast this is this Jewish holiday celebration in religion a holy day holiday in John 2 
John 2, 13. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. We covered that. There's Passover. April, springtime. John 6. Haven't gotten there yet. Lord willing, we shall. John 6. John 6, verse 4. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. Springtime, April there. John 6, 4. John 11. John 11. 55. And the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand. And many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. There's a Passover in John 2. John 6. John 11. <laughs> Common sense. This isn't a single Passover. The Passover in John chapter 11, by the way, that's the Passover for the remainder of the book of John. Jesus dies at that Passover. John 2, a Passover. John 6, a Passover. John 11, a Passover. Three Passovers. In Luke 13, the Lord Jesus Christ refers to his three year long earthly ministry. Now let's count. In John, John 6, John 11. There are three Passovers there. Well, if you have three Passovers, you have three Aprils, you have two years between the three Passovers. Now, John 5, verse 1, that feast is unnamed. There's no name provided. John 5, verse 1, may be a fourth Passover. That's debatable. An alternative idea is John 5, 1 is Pentecost. There is room for a disagreement. However, my personal position John 5, 1 is Passover. It's a Passover. You have four Passovers now in John, thus agreeing with the three years of Luke 13. Be that as it may, whatever feast it is. It is titled a feast of the Jews. That is what the Holy Spirit 
would like us to know about this celebration, this holiday. Let me say something else. If this is a Passover, John 5, verse 1, that means we're already one year into Jesus' earthly ministry. Remember the one in chapter 2? The first Passover. The Lord began his earthly ministry around that Passover. John 5 verse 1, if this is another Passover, I think it is, that means John covered an entire year, one-third of Christ's earthly ministry, in only two and a half chapters. Half of John 2, John 3, all of it. John 4, all of it. I'll say this too. Let's see, Pentecost follows Passover. So those who would see a Passover in John 2, we would see a Passover in John 2. Some of those people would claim, well, how can John then skip so much time? He covers so much time with so little Material. See, Pentecost is 50 days after Passover. So, to them, it's more reasonable to have John 2, the second half, John chapter 2, all of John 3, and all of John 4 cover 50 days as opposed to a year. But listen again, this is what we have to bear in mind concerning John. John's gospel record is intended, the Holy Spirit has designed this fourth gospel record with eight signs in mind. John, of course, naturally will skip a lot of information. That's by divine design. You go over to John 12. How many chapters are in John? 21. John 12. Look at John 12, verse 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany. Right here. The Lord Jesus has approximately one week left to live. As John 12 opens. So listen. John 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10... John 11. John covered Jesus' earthly ministry three years using 11 chapters. He spans John 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. John spends 
10 chapters. He dedicates 10 chapters to the final week of Jesus being alive. John isolates two chapters, 20, 21, for the resurrection of Christ. So John's gospel record, it highlights, it underscores, it stresses certain events. A lot of John's information is not found anywhere else in the Bible. That's by divine design too. Getting back to John 5. John 5, 1. A feast of the Jews. If we take this to be a Passover, I think it is. You can disagree. John 5, 1. If that's a Passover, we come over to John 6, verse 4, and the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. Well, look at that. A whole year, then, is covered in John 5. By the time John 6 opens, it's Passover again. John 5, opening there, Jesus' ministry is one-third finished. By the time we get to chapter 6, as I see it, it's two-thirds finished. That's another Passover. That's his third Passover John 11, it's finished. There's the fourth and final Passover. John 2, John 5, John 6, John 11. The four Passovers. All right. If you take the three Passover position, well, Jesus' earthly ministry then was only about two years long. That's why I hold to the four Passover position. Anyway, let's move along. Our time is elapsing and we have a lot to cover. John 5, 1. After this, so in John's narrative, it's not to say immediately after the events of chapter 4, now this happens. No, as, as John is presenting this, now I would like to discuss this, consider this. That's the Holy Spirit's design here. John 5, 1 again. After this, there was a feast of the Jews. Now, the Passover, John 6, 4, a feast of the Jews. John 7, 2, now the Jews, feast of tabernacles was at hand. John eleven fifty five, and the Jews' Passover was at hand. If you go to the Law of Moses, you'll read about the Jews' feasts. You read about the Lord's feasts, Jehovah God's feasts, Jehovah's feasts. But John's gospel record points out these aren't the Lord's feasts. These are the Jews' feasts. Why? Well, instead of using these feasts to worship the Lord. Well, they worship the feasts. They're religious. 
God gave them the system of the law with all its rules and regulations because that's what they insisted on having at Mount Sinai. If you want to work to be my people, if you want to perform the, obtain the blessing, go for it. Let me tell you now, you'll fail. I've already proven that. You couldn't save yourselves from Egypt, could you? You couldn't provide for your needs in the wilderness. Look at Exodus 14, Exodus 15, Exodus 16, Exodus 17, Exodus 18. The gracious provisions supplied in the wilderness. Israel needed water twice. God gave it. Needed food. God gave it. Needed military victory over the Amalekites. God gave it. Needed wisdom. God gave it. Add to all of that victory over the Egyptians. Pharaoh, the passing through the Red Sea, that miracle. That's what Jehovah God can do for you, Israel, because you can do nothing for him or yourself. He will bless you because he is good, not because you are. Oh, no, Lord. All that the Lord has spoken, we'll do. We can do it. Deceived. Okay, go on ahead and let's see how you do. 613 rules and regulations. I want you to obey every last one of those commandments. Read the rest of the Old Testament canon to see how that turned out. And look at it now in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as Christ's earthly ministry is underway. Have they learned the lesson of the law? The law was pointing them to the Savior. You need a Savior. You can't perform. You aren't perfect. You disobey. That's what sin is. Oh, no thank you. Don't need a Savior. We're okay. We're all right. See, that's religion today. They're religious, they're pious, they're devout. Every Passover, every Pentecost, every tabernacle, three times a year. Exodus 23, Exodus 34, Deuteronomy 16. You can find those male Jews at Jerusalem. But are they there to worship Jehovah God? The Lord. No, this is their religion. It's ours. It's not a feast of the Lord. It's a feast of the Jews. And they're stuck on religion. When it should have been that religion pointing them to Jesus Christ and them being stuck on him. John 5, 1. Jesus went up to Jerusalem. This is Judaism. Judaism. John 2, Judaism. John 5, Judaism. Jesus is under the law. Galatians 4. He's made of a woman, made under the law. Galatians 4, verse 4. This isn't Christianity. I follow Jesus. Oh, do you follow his earthly ministry? I sure do. No, you don't. That verse says, you'll have to go to Jerusalem for the feast. You do that. This is Judaism. 
Jesus knows what his father is doing at that time. Father, the operating system is law, isn't it? Yes, it is, son. And Moses, the law of Moses, commands you to go to Jerusalem for this feast. Obedient, he goes to the feast. At Jerusalem. I'll restate it. Exodus. Exodus 23. 14. Three times thou shalt keep a feast unto me in the year. Keep a feast unto me in the year. It's my feast. My feast. Thou shalt keep the feast of unleavened bread as Passover. Thou shalt eat unleavened bread seven days, as I commanded thee, in the time appointed of the month Abib, as April. For in it thou camest out from Egypt, and none shall appear before me empty. Passover, followed by the seven days of unleavened bread. The Jews would lump Passover and unleavened bread together. They were successive there. Later, in the year 16, Exodus 23, 16, and the Feast of Harvest, the first fruits of thy labors. This is Pentecost, which thou hast sown in the field, and the Feast of Ingathering, that's Tabernacles. Tabernacles is in the fall, autumn, which is in the end of the year, when thou hast gathered in thy labors out of the field. Three times in the year all thy males shall appear before the Lord God. Go to Jerusalem. Deuteronomy 16. Deuteronomy 16. 16. Three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose. Jerusalem. He chooses to put his name in Jerusalem. In the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and in the Feast of Weeks, that's Pentecost, and in the Feast of Tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty. That's the law of Moses. Jesus, under the law, visits Jerusalem. John 5 Verse 2. Now there is at Jerusalem. John is writing. Presently. At Jerusalem. There is a pool. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool. When we introduced the Gospel record of John, and I got into the dating, the dating, when John was writing this. This pool is present. In Jerusalem when John is pinning his gospel record it is believed commonly that John wrote his books gospel record of John those three little epistles at the end first second third John and the Revelation, late in the first century, the A.D. 90s to 100, 60, 70 years after the cross. I don't date John that late. I know on the basis of Colossians 1, One of the Apostle Paul's 
purposes and ministry was to fulfill the word of God to write the mystery program in the Bible. By the time Paul writes his last epistle, a second Timothy, second Timothy three, the closing verses, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Paul died shortly after writing 2 Timothy. The Bible is finished. It's complete by the time Paul dies. The Apostle Paul died before A.D. 70. John can't be writing 20, 30 years later his works. John is writing before Paul dies. When the Romans invaded Jerusalem in A.D. 70, and they destroyed the temple, the pool we're about to discuss That pool was destroyed with the temple. John is writing before the pool is gone. The pool is still there. Is presently. John 5 verse 2. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue, Bethesda, having five porches. Those opening remarks, those aren't controversial. This is. There is at Jerusalem by the sheep market, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue, Bethesda, Bethesda. Now, a textual note, modern English versions introducing more confusion. Hmm. They renamed the pool. Following other Greek texts, not the King James Textus Receptus, they're relying on corrupt manuscripts with various names and readings concerning this passage. The correct name for this pool is in our King James Bible. Bethesda. 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 Beth. Beth. See, this is Hebrew. The Hebrew tongue, the Hebrew language. Bethesda. Beth means house. Like Bethlehem. House of bread. Bethesda, house of what? Mercy. House of mercy. John 5, 2. Having five porches. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. These porches or columns supporting roofs. John 5, verse 3. In these porches, five porches, one, two, three, four, five, in these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, disabled, infirm, 
sick, ill, handicapped, a great multitude of impotent folk, many here are sick. Look at their afflictions. John 5, 3. The impotent folk include blind, halt, withered, and they're waiting for the moving of the water. They're waiting for the moving of the water. They are blind. You know what that means, don't you? Halt. Halt means crippled or lame. Unable to walk. Withered. Withered. Withered is the idea of no water. Dry. Dry. Like a, like a plant. With no water, I'll show you Matthew 12, Matthew chapter 12, for example, Matthew 12, 10, and behold, there was a man which had his hand withered, see the withered hand, it's shriveled, it's dry, Mark 3, verse one, and he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a withered hand, a dry hand. It's useless. It's dead, functionally dead. Physically, he can't use it. No life. In Luke 6, verse 6, And it came to pass also on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught, and there was a man whose right hand was withered. Withered right hand. Luke specifies the right hand. The right hand, the universal symbol for strength, might. That's Israel. Spiritually weak, weak. John 5, verse 3, again, In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. Blind, that's Israel, spiritually blind, Halt, that's spiritually unable to walk, can't walk in God's righteousness, that's Israel. Withered, withered limbs, arms, legs, whatever. They're waiting for the moving of the water. There's hope. The water is being agitated, stirred. Okay, now, here's the controversial verse. <laughs> John 5, 4. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. That's the moving of the water of verse 3. The troubling of the water. Whosoever then, first after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. That's in our King James Bible. John 5, 4. Here's a textual note again. Appealing to a different Greek 
manuscript family. Modern English versions. Bracket verse 4 as doubtful or they outright remove it from the Bible text. Now our King James Bible relying on the Greek Textus Receptus and the majority of surviving Greek manuscripts of John 5 our King James Bible has the verse John 5 4 the 1995 New American Standard Bible bracketed this verse when the New American Standard was revised in 2020 the verse was eliminated entirely. So, in 95, it was doubtful get the readers to be uncertain about it long enough and now they're comfortable with you simply removing it from the text. They bracketed it off. Yeah, now it's gone. Hey. They should have left it alone. If you have an NIV or a an English Standard Version, ESV, you don't have a verse 4. You have it in a footnote. John 5 4. Why would certain, and there are few, why would a few New Testament witnesses lack verse 4? What is so bothersome about verse 4 that Codex Vaticanus, a Roman Catholic manuscript, Codex Sinaiticus, and others would omit it. Actually, their omission begins in John 5, 3, waiting for the moving of the water, the close of John 5, 3, that's absent. And then all of verse 4. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. All of that is removed. In modern textual critics' circles, not inspired of God. Someone added those comments after John wrote. Hmm. Okay. That is unbelief. Okay. If those words were added after John wrote, what else would have been added after John wrote? Okay. Once you get on that path of doubt, that's a route of no return. That isn't faith. Okay. We take our King James Bible. That is our final authority. And we leave those who want to be willfully ignorant alone. Okay. The natural man fakers. Leave them to their... To themselves. John 5 verse 3 again. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for
for the moving of the water. The water is moving. Verse 4 is an explanation. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. How do I know those words were in John's original gospel record? Nobody added them. The Holy Spirit did write them through the Apostle John. How do I know? You see, human wisdom aside, scholarship aside, the Holy Spirit shows me those words are inspired. When I look at verse 7, read verse 7, John 5, 7. The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. What in the world are you talking about, impotent man? If you don't have the end of verse 3 and all of verse 4 to explain, you don't know what verse 7 is talking about, do you? You don't. So listen, watch. Let's take the textual critic's position for a moment. I will speak to you as a scholar now. Oh, what a privilege. I don't believe John wrote these words. These aren't inspired of God. Waiting, verse 3, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. I don't believe those words belong in the Bible. They're an interpolation. In addition, they are, are they? Well, verse 7 contradicts me. So either I'm right, I'm the scholar, I say I'm right, or verse 7, the Bible is right. Which one is it? Is the scholar right or the Bible? Because we have let scholarship infiltrate us with unbelief for so many decades and centuries, now we don't know what to believe. Okay. Our faith is not resting in a pure Bible, but rather a Bible that's close enough to the originals, but not exactly. Why? Because the scholars say it's not an exact of the original. That's why you need us. With our education, our degrees, and our intellect to tell you what the real Bible is, what the Bible says, and what it means. Oh, is that dangerous? That's dangerous. That's the attitude that drives the modern version movement. That is what you find at the heart of cults and sects and denominations. Apostasy and unbelief. Because it's human intellect running it all. Not the Holy Spirit. The natural man is in the leadership position. Not the spiritual man. We start off with unbelief. I don't have a perfect Bible. My perfect Bible is in the originals. Well, where are the original manuscripts? Oh, they're lost. They've disintegrated. Well, didn't God promise to preserve his word and words? Yes, no. That's why you need the scholar. 
Whatever got lost, the scholar can revive and reconstruct. <laughs> and that's why you have all these revisions, all these new translations. We're getting closer to the truth. We found another manuscript reading. No. 6,000 years of human history testify to the fact man hasn't gotten closer to the truth, has he? He's gotten further from it. Further. Verse 7. Verse 7. Look in the modern English versions. Verse 7 is there. The Greek texts have verse 7. Verse 7 presupposes verses 3 and 4. So if you claim verses 3 and 4, don't be long, well then you'll have to throw out verse 7 because verse 7 validates verses 3 and 4. The passage does not make sense unless you have a King James Bible, the Bible in its entirety. Okay. All right, that is the controversial portion. I told you, hmm, people don't like that. You mean to tell me the scholar lied to me? My modern English version is wrong? Yes. And that's what you get when you depend on natural man thinking and conjectures and hunches and hypotheses and textual theories. Relying on man, that's always a disappointment. That's why, my friend, I would strongly urge you take a King James Bible and never let it go. I can tell you, it is God's inspired, preserved word in English. I make no apologies about it. Where is my final authority? Where is my perfect Bible? Here it is. I can produce it. Ask the scholars. Ask the textual critics. Where is your perfect Bible? Oh, we believe the perfect Bible is in the original manuscripts. And where are those original manuscripts? Not here. <laughs> so in other words, they have a non-existent authority. Their faith is in something that doesn't exist. No longer with us. Well, what a convenient loophole. Now the unbelievers, the skeptics, the Bible rejectors, now they have an excuse. God can't hold me responsible for not believing His Word. We didn't have it anyway. At the great white throne judgment, can you imagine? In Revelation 20, all the lost people, they're arguing with God, but we didn't have a perfect Bible. It was lost. We didn't know what to believe. We didn't know what your will was. That will not be valid, huh? God's preserved words... They're here with us now. In English, it's an authorized version, King James Bible, whether we agree with it or not. It is the final authority. It is our final authority. When it says something, we either agree with it or we're wrong. Okay. Our final authority is not what the Pope's Bible says, Vaticanus or what the seminary professor says, the textual critic says, the preacher. Your final authority is not me either. No teacher. The Holy Spirit, He is the real teacher of Scripture. And if he's not teaching through a man, it's the man or the devil teaching through that man. 
Serious, serious, serious. John 5, verse 4, well, verse 3. These sick people, impotent folk, they're waiting for the moving of the water. There's hope. What is the hope? We can be recovered. We can be healed, delivered from our infirmities. Verse 4, John 5, 4. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Verse 7 only makes sense when we have verse 4. Okay. An angel goes down at a certain time to trouble the waters of the pool of Bethesda. The first person to get into that water, only the first person to get into the water is healed. So we have this crowd, a lot of people under these five porches, reclining, sitting, lying down, looking for help, a cure. The angel comes down, stirs the water, hurry up! Let's see if I can get in before everyone else. <laughs> Verse 7, the impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. <clears throat> he got in first. She beat me to it. No healing for me. See, verse 4 is a real problem to so many even now. That's why they remove it from their Bibles. The copyists of those corrupt manuscripts, those modern version manuscripts, Greek manuscripts, and other languages. As they were copying John 5, when they came to verse 3, at the end, waiting for the moving of the water in verse 4, the angel stirring up the water. Those copyists realized this isn't going on now. That pool isn't here in Jerusalem anymore. See, they're writing, they're copying. Decades and centuries after John wrote. Since there was no pool of Bethesda at Jerusalem, and there was no angel visiting the pool to supply healing there, at the time they were copying John 5, well, that's a real headache for us. No, it isn't. Just eliminate the verse. There never was a pool, see. There was no such yelling pool. See, that's a lack of right division. No dispensational Bible study. Listen, just because God did something in the past, that doesn't mean that He's doing that now. Whatever He's doing now, he may not do in the future. And he won't do in the future. God's dealings with man change because man changes. Listen, if you go to Jerusalem today, you won't find the pool of Bethesda with an angel swooping down and providing healing. So, if we can't find that today, if we think denominationally, well then there never was a pool like that. 
You see, it was that false assumption that governs the corruption in the modern English versions, texts. The healing pool of Bethesda was there during Christ's earthly ministry with the dispensational change now in effect. There is no healing pool in Jerusalem, okay? Has it been for 2,000 years? But at the time of Christ's earthly ministry, not today, God was doing something else. Okay. Now remember these verses in Matthew to John. God is teaching Israel doctrine. These miracles are intended to convey sound Bible doctrine, God's word. Keep reading. It'll make sense, just keep reading. John 5, 4, an angel went down and at a certain season, here's the moving of the water, for an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. This pool and this angel. <laughs> Let me wear my denominational eyeglasses here. The pool represents water baptism. And the angel symbolizes the Holy Spirit. Wrong. That's one explanation and it's wrong. That's not, that's not what the Holy Spirit is teaching here. We look at verses. There's a pool. It's the pool of Bethesda, House of Mercy. Israel needs mercy, doesn't she? Mercy is to hold back what someone deserves. You deserve punishment. I will decline to punish you. Okay? That's mercy. Grace is what you don't deserve. Getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is what you deserve being held back. Grace is you receive what you do not deserve. What God can do for sinners, that's grace. Okay? John 5, 4. An angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. The angel going down. In the book of Acts. Look at Acts. Acts 7. Acts 7.53, Acts 7.53, Stephen preaching to apostate Israel before they stone him to death. You who have received the law, that's Moses, the law of Moses, who have received the law of Moses by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. All that the Lord hath spoken, ye have not done. Amen, Stephen. No. They don't praise the Lord. 
They kill Stephen. They don't want to hear from God. Quiet. And they take Stephen's life. Blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Israel falls right there. Temporarily, but falls nonetheless. Galatians. Galatians 3. Galatians 3.19 Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. The mediator is Moses. Angels participated in the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. One more. Hebrews 2, verse 2. Hebrews 2, 2. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, that's the law, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first, verse 3, began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? Spoken by the Lord, that's his earthly ministry. Matthew to John, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. That's early Acts. Verse 4, early Acts, Pentecost. Verse 5, the Holy Spirit's ministry in the opening chapters of Acts. Israel didn't listen to the law. Oh, if that was a severe penalty there, wait until you, Israel, refuse to hear Matthew to John, Jesus and Matthew to John, and the early acts. A worse punishment is coming. It's the baptism with fire. Okay. Second coming wrath. Daniel's 70th week, the tribulation wrath. The law represents God's life. That's how God lives. That's His righteousness. That's the standard of His rightness. The law... Let me show you this. Show you this. Galatians. Galatians 3.21 Is... The law then against the promises of God, God forbid. For if there had been a law given, which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. 22. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. If there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. Look at all these standards, these rules and regulations in the law of Moses. This is God's life. This is God's standard of living. Now what is the problem? All are under sin. No one's perfect. That's what sin is. Sin is the transgression of the law. God's bar of righteousness is here. And whether we jump this high, or this high, or even this high, we don't jump here. We all fall short. I'm better than you. Praise the Lord. He's better than you. Relative righteousness. That's not enough. It's, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. He's the standard. And everyone is sinful according to Him. And sin is sin. The law cannot give life. Because sinners are dead and unable to live according to the law. We can't make it. 
That's what sin is. The pool, the water, eternal life, everlasting life. You see, the angel coming down in John 5, verse 4, look at the giving of the law pictured there. The angel agitating the water. This is how you have eternal life. See this water? You come into the water. See the sick people there? Keep reading. John 5, 5. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. Thirty-eight years. That's longer than the Lord Jesus has been alive. I don't know the man's age, but if he's been sick for thirty-eight years, he's at least that old. Thirty-eight. Bible study. Bible study. Thirty-eight. What is the significance of thirty-eight in the Bible? Let's try Deuteronomy. See, listen, I, I make this point from time to time. Why is that put in Scripture? He's been infirm for 38 years. I don't know. I don't understand. Let's close the Bible and give it up. See, that's a lazy man's approach. When we come to verses that we have difficulty with, let's, let's, let's give God's word the benefit of the doubt. We've been trained in churches. Our pastors, our teachers were taught to treat the Bible like this in seminary and Bible college. If there's a verse you don't understand or you don't want to believe, well, you just eliminate it. You ignore it. You retranslate it to teach what you want it to teach. I assume it should say something else. Let me change the Bible. No, no, no. We don't change the Bible. The Bible changes us. Should be. Should be that way. So watch. The mature Bible student well, look, compare verses. Let's flip to Deuteronomy 2 and see if there's any light here. Deuteronomy 2, 14. And the space in which we came from Kadesh Barnea until we were come over the brook Zered was thirty and eight years until all the generation of the men of war were wasted out from among the host, as the Lord sware unto them. For indeed the hand of the Lord was against them, to destroy them from among the host, until they were consumed. That's unbelieving Israel. The forty years, rounded off to forty years, of wilderness wanderings, that was because of unbelief. Numbers 14. All the unbelievers who didn't want to go into God's land. They died off in the wilderness for the next four decades. Sin. Sin. Sinful Israel. Well, here we are, 1,500 years later in John 5. And what do we have in John 5? Sinful Israel. Still rebelling. Still refusing to believe God's word to them. John 5. John 5, verse 5. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity. Thirty and eight years. 
has he been suffering? We don't know what particular medical condition he suffers from. It's a sickness. It's an illness. It limits his mobility. Verse 7. Whatever he has afflicting him. He's disabled. John 5, verse 6. When Jesus saw him lie. <laughs> that's not... Total lie. <laughs> it's the man is stretched out. He's sprawled. He's reclining. He's lying down. Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case. He saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? A long time. Jesus knows this man has been in pitiful physical shape for a long time. There's his deity. Remember John 1? John 1. John 1, 48, Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? How do you know me? Jesus knew Nathanael because Jesus was and is God. We've never met. How do you know such personal information about me? Well, because Jesus is God, that's why, Nathaniel. Remember the Samaritan woman in John 4? John 4. John 4, verse 19. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. How do you know my intimate details? My romantic life? See, he's God. He knew this man, the infirm man, at the pool of Bethesda, has been now a long time in that case. He saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? It's not, is God willing, or is Jesus willing to heal? It's not, can God heal, or can Jesus heal? It's, do you, the sick, do you want to be healed? See, the willingness is that of the person. God is willing. Jesus is willing. God can. Jesus can. But does the impotent man want? Volition, free will. The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. See, he's limited physically. The man is lying down. The angel comes, stirs the water. Oh, and the man, he does the best he can with what he has. He's hurrying as quickly as he can to get to the pool first. And he fails. Somebody gets to the pool first. Okay, there is Israel unable to attain to the righteousness of the law. I can't have eternal life. I can't do it. That's why. I don't have eternal life. I can't measure up. I can't perform. I can't make it. I need someone else to do it for me. I have no man when the water is lifted to pick me up 
to carry me along and put me into the pool. I have no man when the water is troubled. That's because the angel there is troubling the pool. See, you need verse 3 and verse 4. I have no one to put me into the pool. As the water's troubled, while I'm coming, I'm trying to get there. It works religion. I'm doing the best I can. We set aside pride. We throw up the hands and we say, I can't do it. I'm a sinner. I can't measure up. You see, that's an insult to our ego, huh? Because religion instills in us that idea of, yes, you can. See, that's the deceitful heart. Yes, I can make it. Just give me another chance. No, no, no. God says, no, no, no. It has to be grace. I have to do it for you on your behalf. No, I want to do it. And then there's the boast. See? The sinful flesh. Fighting against what God wants. The flesh wants to work. Yeah. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. There is pictured believing Israel. Watch. Jesus saith unto him, John 5, 8. Rise, take up thy bed and walk. He wanted eternal life, didn't he? He keeps trying to get it, to go to the pool. He just can't perform. And he recognizes, I can't measure up perfectly. That's what sin is. Well, listen, John 5, 8, that's okay. God knew that all along. He knew that 15 centuries ago, but Israel didn't believe it at the time. We can make it. No, you can't. Yes, we can make it. No, you can't. Yes, arguing with the Lord. Just like today, exactly like today. John 5, 8, Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. You can't walk. You've admitted it. You need someone to carry you, to do it for you. So the powerful word of God, the living, the life-giving, the quick and powerful word of God, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, they are life, John 6, 63, Hebrews 4, 12. The spiritual health, the spiritual life, the eternal life, the power of God that spoke the universe into existence. That powerful word of God travels to that infirm man's body, passes through him, rise. Take up thy bed and walk. God did it. And immediately, John 5, 9, And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. The infirm man... Confessing, I'm a sinner. I failed. I am unable to have eternal life in and of myself. Okay, Jesus replies, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. The health that God can give to Israel, spiritual health now, is exhibited there with the physical health imparted to the impotent man. Rise! The powerful word of God 
gives the man's body, lying down there, strength to get up and walk. Walk! That's Israel restored in the kingdom. The power to become the sons of God, John 1, 12. Here's another miracle. This is the third miracle of John's gospel record. The sign, one of those signs of the gospel of the kingdom in John, John 20, again, John 20, verse 30. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing he might have life through his name, eternal life. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, gospel of the kingdom. Signs, eight signs in John's gospel record. Here's number three. The impotent man. Israel needs grace, doesn't she? Yes, she does. She needs mercy and she needs grace. God could have left her. God could have left that man in that pitiful condition. But he showed the man and he will show Israel at Christ's return. Mercy. I will hold back what you deserve and I will give you Grace, what you don't deserve, the new covenant. Eternal life, life in the kingdom, restoration, redemption, justification, sanctification, on and on and on. Immediately, immediately, John 5, 7, Sir, I have no man. He doesn't call Jesus Lord. Or son of David, like the Samaritan woman, like the nobleman, John 4. Sir! No, he's Jesus is more than sir. Okay. This impotent man, he's in the dark spiritually concerning Jesus' identity. Sir, I have no man. We'll see next time. He doesn't even know who healed him. John 5, 9. Immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Immediately. Immediately. Okay. This wasn't a gradual healing. I'll read you these verses, references here. You can look them up. Matthew 8, 3. Matthew 20, 34. Mark 1, 31. 42. Mark 2, 12. Mark 10, 52. Luke 4, 39. Luke 5, 13, Luke 8, 44 and 47, Luke 13, 13, Luke 18, 43. You can also see Acts 3, verse 7 and Acts 9, 34. Immediately the man was made whole. Immediately. Those instant miracles of the Lord Jesus and his apostles. Those in Acts. Immediately. Instantly. The man was made whole. And to prove his health. Has been restored. His strength. Has been given to him. He takes up his bed. His pallet. His mattress. Look at the strength. And he walks. Was it that the man who 
lie down by the pool, helpless. Yeah, that was him. Look at him now, walking. Walking in righteousness. That's Israel. Walking in righteousness in the kingdom. Not a gradual recovery. Instant. Instantaneous. He's made whole. He walks. This is the third gospel record of John miracle. John 2. Recall the water and the wine. John 4. The healing of the Nobleman's sick son dying, nearly dead. The water and the wine. God gives Israel life, his word, his Holy Spirit, transformed into joy. Kingdom restoration. John 4, the nobleman's son. That's also a picture of Israel. Dying, unable to serve God in the ministry. Can't be God's kingdom of priests. Health and life imparted to him. The nobleman believed. See, Israel needs faith. Well, here in John 5, the impotent man. Israel needs grace. What God can do for her through the new covenant because she has failed miserably under the old covenant. The wall is not made To show Israel or us how good any of us or the law condemns. Who works wrath? Israel needs to learn. It's not performance based. It's Jesus based acceptance. The man takes up his bed and he walks. Uh oh, is there trouble? Why? Look at the end of verse 9. And on the same day was the Sabbath. And now we get into combat. The significance of the Sabbath day. This is one of the Sabbath day miracles of the Lord Jesus Christ. Recorded in the Bible. That Sabbath points to the kingdom restoration of Israel. And we'll save that for next time. Thank you, Father God, for your word. In Christ's name, amen.